Yeah, good day, and uh, welcome to a special live stream for Budget Week. Uh, it's called Unleashing Our Potential, and it's all about Act's alternative budget. Uh, we released this today, and it's been described by pundits in the media uh, as a comprehensive, robust, uh, and a little bit radical initiative. Uh, what this is really all about is the massive vacuum and real political debate in New Zealand. We've been living in a kind of, I guess, kind police state for the last eight weeks or so. But the fog is slowly lifting, the anaesthetic is wearing off, and people are starting to ask big questions like, how can we afford this? How does New Zealand grow its economy out of this crisis? And what is our country going to look like in the future? I'd put it to people that there's basically two options. Option one is that we're going to have a lot more spending, a lot more government leading the economy, a lot more debt as a result, and then more taxes, either now or in the future. That is an option that New Zealand has tried before. We've had lots of government direction, lots of spending, lots of tax, lots of debt, and the country almost went broke. I'm talking about the whole period from, the world, from world War II through to 1984, when the country got within a few dollars of total bankruptcy. The alternative is an open approach a low tax, high growth recovery led by the private sector where we embrace the world. We don't see trade and foreign investment as a threat, but as a sign that people value what we have to offer. We see it as trading value for value and getting stronger together with the rest of the world, bringing in capital, opening up employment opportunities and letting our next generation build homes that are connected by infrastructure to opportunity just like the boomers did. That's the basic choice. On the one hand, you've got the government command and control. On the other hand, you've got X offering a free and open economy with a high growth recovery led by the private sector. So let's get into it. Unleashing our potential is the name that we've chosen. Uh, and as we get into the start, there are five parts to this, five key objectives. One is getting Kiwis back to work. We're going to see the word unemployment re-enter the national lexicon in a way that we have not seen in modern New Zealand history, certainly not in the time of anyone under 30. I can just remember the early 90s when I was very young, when we had unemployment, you know, maybe not 10%, but close, and that was a really hard time. It divided families, it sapped people's motivation, and it led to increased poverty, the return of food banks, things that we hadn't seen for a long time in New Zealand history. We cannot have unemployment for a long time at the kinds of levels of 10 or 15% that are being forecast. And unfortunately, as the wage subsidy we have right now runs out, as people start to get into corporate restructuring, we are going to see those dull queues rise and we have to fix it. So the first objective in the alternative budget put forward by ACT this morning is getting Kiwis back to work. The second part is protecting public health. We simply cannot afford to take the kind of unintelligent, blunt approach of stay home, stay lives that we've had for the last eight weeks. Sure, it works and we've got a lot less virus but we've also destroyed so many livelihoods in the process. This is gonna happen again. This will not be the last pandemic. You look at human history, we've been having them for a very long time. What we have to ensure is that when this does happen again, we have a response more like Taiwan. Very good technology, very good preparedness, and most importantly, the world's smartest borders so that people and money can keep coming through the New Zealand border because our industries such as tourism and export education are highly dependent on that, but the virus can't. So that's number two, protecting public health with the world's smartest borders. Number three is balancing the books, because this government is about to blow out and spend money like it's water. The Reserve Bank is aiming to print $60 billion and basically give it straight to the government, which will then spend. But hang on, that has to be paid back sooner or later. Any money the government borrows from the Reserve Bank or on the international markets has to be paid back. And it's critical that we maintain a focus on controlling costs and stopping government deficits so that we don't end up paying for uh, the today's spending for another generation. That is not only 
inefficient in the economic sense. It's totally unfair on the people who will pick up the tab. Next is if we're going to have a private sector-led recovery, uh, we've got to cut red tape. There is far too much activity where people spend more time asking permission to do work, filling out compliance, proving that they've done work, making sure they've satisfied the latest government inspection, um, and not enough time actually doing work that provides for ourselves and our families. So we've got serious initiatives I'll get onto about how we cut red tape and regulation. The final and fifth part, the fifth and final uh, part of this is building the future. We've got new ideas for infrastructure and getting homes built. One of the most important things for the next generation of New Zealanders is that they're able to purchase a home they can afford that is connected to opportunity through quality infrastructure. We've got some radical ideas about how we can learn from the Singaporeans and actually get people moving on our roads again and get infrastructure built. So those are our five points. Get Kiwis back to work, protect public health, balance the books so we don't indebt ourselves in the next generation, cut red tape so we don't spend all our time doing compliance exercises, and build for the future in terms of infrastructure and housing. Let's start with getting Kiwis back to work. There's lots of people talking about throwing government money around at this industry or that, and it's the oldest political trick in the book. Find a group of people that might vote for you, tax everyone else that probably won't, give the money to your voters. Unfortunately, this is a road to poverty in the long term, and we've seen it build up over a long period of time. Student loans started off with interest, then it was interest-free when you study, then interest-free forever. Now, hey, uh, fees-free for the first year. And the joke is on tertiary graduates who end up paying more in terms of their income tax over their lifetime to pay for that sort of bribe. Then there's Kiwi Saver subsidies. Then there's winter energy payments. It just goes on and on. And we end up paying tax to give each other money, but none of us are better off. In fact, because you pay more tax when you work and you get more money if you don't, we actually end up with people less likely to do useful things. So instead of spending more money to get Kiwis back to work, we're going to not take more money, but reduce what the government takes. First of all, a 5% cut to GST for one year. That'll put about $6 billion of extra money circulating in the economy. So you go from 10, 15% down to 10. Everything gets cheaper, people take more money home, and you end up with more economic activity. That could be vital for keeping businesses going and afloat. Then we do a permanent income tax cut for middle income earners. Right now, if you earn anything uh, between forty-eight and $70,000, uh, you pay 30%. So that's that critical amount for people who are working full time is that they all get whacked by that 30% tax rate. We take that away, cut it down to 17 and a half. So you pay 10 and a half percent on your first 14 grand like now. Uh, you pay 17 and a half percent from 14 grand to 70. And then uh, you pay the existing 33% on income over th over 70 grand. We'd love to cut a lot more. Our previous tax po cut, uh, tax policy was a flat tax of 17 and a half all the way through. Then we had this massive issue uh, with the uh, COVID crisis. The government spent an extra 30 or $40 billion so far, and it's no longer viable uh, to have X flat tax in the immediate term. But we can issue a generous middle income tax cut of 30% down to 17.5 for that crucial 48 to 70 grand uh, bracket. And of course, if you earn more than that, you still get that tax cut, you just keep paying 33 on your higher income. So tax cuts are absolutely critical. The other things about getting people back to work are some of the rules. So putting up the minimum wage where no one was actually working was completely nuts. On the 1st of April, uh, we put the minimum wage, or the government put the minimum wage, uh, from 1770 up to 1890. And what that really means is that a whole lot of people that might have got hired back actually just won't because business people and employers will look at the books and say, we can't afford to do it. And not only can we not afford to pay people at 1890, but we can't afford to pay higher wages for all the people up the chain because, of course, when the minimum wage goes up, everything changes. The question is simple. It's not, do we want to be good people and say, oh, we're going to have an increased minimum wage and give everyone more money? No government can actually do that. 
it can only ban jobs below a certain level of wage. What we're proposing is to go back to the 2019 minimum wage of 1770 and freeze it for three years. Now, some people say, oh, that's so mean. Well, here's the thing. It's a minimum wage. It's not a maximum. There's no reason uh, why people can't be paid more uh, than the minimum wage. But there is a reason why people can't be paid less, and that is because it's illegal. Our proposal is to make sure that people are more likely to get back into a job. And on that, we're also taking the 12th, the current 90-day trial to a 12-month probationary period for new employees. Now, that's voluntary. You can take a job and insist that they don't give you a probationary period if you want. But we also make it legal for employers that are trying to get their business back up. They don't know what the next 12 months is going to be like, but they want to give someone a chance. Uh, we actually want that sort of stuff to happen. It's the kind of stuff we need in an economy. There's people taking risks, taking on new workers, people taking a chance on a job so that economic activity happens. We can't afford for people to hang back because they're worried about getting stuck with an expensive personal grievance uh, or other employment law situation. So 12 month voluntary probationary period um, for new employees. Uh, the next, uh, next uh, topic we have is protecting public health. Now it's absolutely critical um, that we actually ensure that this does not happen to us again. We couldn't afford the blunt approach that was taken uh, of basically saying, look, we, there's a virus coming, everyone stay home, shut down the economy for six weeks. Uh, it has decimated our economy. It has ruined lives. And we've heard about some things absolutely tragic as people have responded to that. Um, now, when it comes to protecting public health, there are two parts of this for New Zealand. One is we've got to have the world's smartest borders. When I hear things like, Emirates developing technology to test people as they get on the plane and tell you, look, if you, don't, if you have a positive COVID test, you can't fly. We need that sort of intelligence so people and money can come through the borders, export education students, tourists, but the virus can't. And we've got to put more money in, so an extra $78 million in border funding so we can invest in that kind of technology and have the world's smartest borders. The next thing is inside New Zealand, we've got to be far better at tracking and tracing viruses. So we've had a situation where the Ministry of Health and these illogical system of 12 public health units around the country, were using Excel spreadsheets to try and trace people. That's pathetic. I look at Taiwan, they got on top of this thing, had only six deaths and 400 cases amongst 23 million people with no lockdown. We need to get to Taiwanese levels of public health sophistication. And the ACT Party says we should put a permanent 50% increase uh, onto public health funding. That's an extra $220 million uh, so that we're able uh, to be smarter at managing pandemics and don't have to use the kind of blunt techniques that we use this time. Moving on to issue three, uh, balancing the budget. Now, this is a biggie. It's a little bit to work through. There's five scenarios that Treasury has, um, and they all depend on how long we're in lockdown and what the world economy is like. So scenario one and scenario five are both a, a short lockdown, which looks like what we're going to have, four to six weeks in level four or three, and another 10 months um, in level one or two. Now, those scenarios, the difference between level one and level five is that level five uh, has a really weak um, Situa level five has a really weak uh, global economy. So, you know, the scenario is not so good and you can see that in the graphs. But what's important um, is that when we get to the year 2024, under X scenario, under every uh, X budget, under every scenario, the government is back in surplus. Under the current government scenario, uh, under level five, short lockdown in New Zealand, weak global economy, looks like the most likely scenario. Uh, we are going to see a $4 billion deficit in 2024, and we just can't afford to keep borrowing like that. So X plan to balance the budget is absolutely critical um, to the future of New Zealand and to fairness between generations. Uh, moving along from that, uh, we get to how we actually balance the budget. So if you start off with that $4 billion deficit, uh, we're shown how we can have seven and a half billion dollars of savings 
Then we cut tax by three billion, so that that, that, that takes out some of that. Um, and then you have some targeted spending at public health that gets you to a zero point three uh, billion dollar surplus by 2024. So 300 million in the black. Um, how do we save that money? Well, first of all, we cut bureaucracy. Uh, then we cut middle class welfare. So a lot of that stuff where people are handed huge amounts of money basically because it shores up votes for whatever party's in power, um, it has to stop. It's a mugs game. You're paying for it in your taxes. Uh, we're not going to keep doing KiwiSaver subsidies. People can save for themselves if they want to, even more if they don't have to pay so much tax, and that's why we're giving a tax cut. Uh, we give $2 billion a year in corporate welfare, basically, to companies. Uh, what is the point? Companies are supposed to generate money and pay tax, not take other companies' taxes. Uh, again, it's driven by politicians trying to bribe uh, voters rather than actually make us wealthier. Um, and finally, the, the government's increase in the benefit of $25 a week in the middle of this crisis was absolutely outrageous. It was nothing to do with COVID. Beneficiaries were largely unaffected. They didn't have to stop going to work. They already weren't going to work. Um, and we can save $1.4 billion by reducing that. So you add it all up and it shows how we can cut taxes, cut spending, get rid of the deficit and put New Zealand in surplus so we don't make future generations broke. Um, and a balanced budget really is a sign of, are you serious about New Zealand for the long term? Or are you serious about trying to get re-elected by spending other people's money? The ACT Party has always been in it for the long term. Maybe it hasn't always made us as popular as people that hand out other people's money to get votes, uh, but we're after the intelligent voter and that's you. So moving on to our next little slide, um, cutting red tape, you know, it's absolutely critical that we stop making a new law every time politicians get in trouble because we end up with poor quality laws that tie people up in red tape and compliance and actually make us poorer over time. So first of all, um, we need to boost the private primary industries. You know, the, the water regulations are far too expensive for the environmental benefits they deliver. And we got some good analysis to show that we could pare back the water regulations. You don't have to fence every tiny stream for five meters on either side, um, or maybe it's from the edge of the stream, nobody knows, uh, to improve water quality. There's a whole lot of things there we can do that are good for the rural sector, good for New Zealand, and won't actually hurt the environment. Secondly, we've got to encourage foreign investment. Some people see foreign investment as a bad thing. The weird thing about that is that the whole history of New Zealand is a history of foreign investment. When Coupe rode up or, or sailed up on his Wakahorua, there was no foreign investment in New Zealand and there wasn't much wealth or, or lifestyle in it either. Since then, people have brought their capital from overseas and it's been a real boon to New Zealand. The other way I put it for people who really don't like foreigners or other countries and want to just be in New Zealand, I mean, I disagree with you, I like the world, but hey, um, immigration is when people come here. Foreign investment is when people stay home and just send their money. So you should be happy about this uh, if you have that manner of thinking. But what is going to be critical is that companies are able to get cash to buy plant and invest in new ideas to create jobs. So what we're saying is that instead of being one of the most draconian countries that's one of the hardest for foreigners to invest in, we are going to open it up to people from friendly countries. And by that, I mean the OECD countries, the 40-odd countries that are largely our friends who are democracies. It doesn't include, for instance, China. Um, and those countries are the ones that we want to say, look, if you want to invest, uh, we're going to get rid of all the red tape and bureaucracy. What we are going to do is say, if you have any security interest, if you want to buy a military plant, then, then sure, the government's got a role there. Otherwise, it's up to a willing buyer and a willing seller if the investment originates in a friendly country. The regulatory reset is all about changing the way that we regulate. We say rules have to have a 10-year expiry date. If a rule's no good, uh, then it won't be renewed. If the government thinks it is good, they can justify renewing it. We can't just be constantly beset by more red tape and regulations. And in doing that, we're also going to introduce a regulatory constitution so that when a law is made, people actually have to ask the questions. What is this doing <clears throat> to our property, to our private property rights? What are the costs and benefits of this law? If the government just focused on answering those questions would be a lot better off. Then we come to rebuilding the future, which is our fifth and final uh, slide here. 
Uh, at least I hope we do. There's two big issues, I believe, in the long term, and they're related. The first is housing. Uh, we have a problem in this country. The price of a section in Auckland's gone up 900% in 25 years. Uh, it's gone up, you know, five or six times faster than inflation. And that's meant there's a whole generation of people who cannot afford a place to live in that's connected to opportunity by quality infrastructure. And by opportunity, I mean good jobs and educational opportunities. So we need to stop that. We need to get rid of the Resource Management Act. It's a dog. Even the government has found that its own pet projects are stopped by the RMA, so they're trying to rush through exemptions, but only for their projects. We say repeal it and replace it with a new Urban Development Act based um, on the Productivity Commission's better urban planning. And what that basically does is says if you're not interfering with existing property rights, if you're not looking into someone's bathroom through the window of your new house, um, then you can build. And if councils don't free up enough land, uh, they get penalised. So the objective of the Urban Development Act is to make sure the next generation has an availability of land to build their futures just the way the boomers did. We'd also liberalise building laws. Uh, and people say, oh, what about leaky buildings? Just remember, leaky buildings was caused by council inspections. Councils should have been fired uh, from inspecting buildings a long time ago. What we're proposing is mandatory private insurance. So you've got some accountability around the quality of your building, but also flexibility because at the moment, councils just say no to everything. Uh, and then when it comes to infrastructure, look, we're saying take the roads out of the NZTA, put them in a new infrastructure corporation and give that infrastructure corporation uh, no petrol tax, but the ability to use GPS tracking to actually charge people who use the roads in real time to change the prices to manage demand. And we give them the objective of achieving traffic flow rates. So right now, it's almost as though the government's trying to stop people driving. Uh, we're actually going to give them objectives of achieving traffic flow, and they can enter into Australian-style public-private partnerships with private capital to build more roads. This is all over Australia. It works great. It's one of the reasons Sydney is doing so much better than Auckland in so many ways. Uh, so that's building for the future housing and infrastructure. I can't remember if we've got a, a, a follow-up slide. If not, i really happy to, to take some questions. Um, I saw a few there. Um, Simon Court says, great ideas for UDA and governance of infrastructure. Oh, well, th thanks, Simon. It's a really great idea. And We'd love to get you on board helping to promote it. Um, then there's, um, oh, what else have we got here? A flat rate would be easier. Yeah, I agree. A flat tax is one of my favourite policies, but because of the fiscal blowout we've just had, um, it's not possible in the near future. Um, just had Garbe right, May, you're nailing it in this alternative budget. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, then what else have we got? Rachel Jane says the budget policy statement from December is very high level and doesn't call out housing. Um, as Kiwi has failed to deliver, didn't address land availability. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right about that. Um, and yes, Rachel, we, we certainly would focus on the archaic consenting process. That's what's made it so hard to build. And if we want to get the construction industry back on track, we're actually going to have to get rid of the bureaucracy that makes it so hard um, to open up land and let people build homes, which is going to be hard enough for the construction industry as it is, let alone having to deal with the current council and consenting regime. So it's actually critical that we work on this. Um, I wonder what else. Um, Ryan Miller says, uh, bro, you're going to fail that uni study if your assignments are on a par with the quality of this piss poor, uh, keep step up your game. I, I think that's not meant for me, but um, good on you, Ryan Miller. Um, <laughs> Simon Court says congestion and demand pricing will transform transport modes and make it more attractive to walk and cycle. Look, I think that's true. And I'm not into telling people that you must use a car or you must use a train or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I get around, I got my car, I got my sports car, I got my e-bike, um, I got my um, taxi card from the taxpayer, thank you. Um, and um, I also occasionally get on a train because it's a good way to get into the Auckland CBD. So I'm not in favour of telling everyone what the best way to get around is. I'm in favour of freedom. But what I do know is that if we had to pay the price of using roads in real time, uh, then we suddenly start saying it's very expensive to drive across the Harbour Bridge at peak time. 
that's a good time to take another mode. On the other hand, uh, people that drive off peak, you know, aren't doing any, aren't creating any congestion. They should pay less, uh, and people will make better decisions if we just let them see the prices of what they're doing. Justin McCulloch says, I've always been a national supporter, but just can't see why I'd vote for them at the moment. Would never vote later as so a bunch of losers. Oh, sorry, nice. Uh, can can you make a difference, David? Will you have a voice of photodynamics? Mate, I've got a voice now, and uh, the proposal saying we're going to you know, triple or quadruple or quintuple the number of ACT MPs. So just imagine five of me. Um, I'll just give you an example of what it means for ACT to grow. At the moment, under the rules of parliament, I basically get to ask one question with two follow-ups every month. Um, and it's pretty hard to nail the Prime Minister when you've only got two follow-up questions. So, you know, if we got four or five MPs in, uh, we'd have one nearly every day. Um, and the, the difference that makes is just huge because at the moment, even if I do nail them with two subs, I've got them on the ropes, I've got to wait for another month before I can ask a follow-up question. So even just the number of questions that would get to ask in Parliament uh, would massively change if we had more MPs. So in answer to the, the question, yes, voting for Act make a huge difference and it might be the difference uh, between keeping this government or having a new one. Uh, let's look for some more questions. Um, Oh, what do we got? What do we got here? Um, please get a representative for Palmerston North. I think we got a great uh, candidate there. Um, I can't say who it is because they're just being signed up. Um, but uh, Palmy will have good act representation, I'm sure. Uh, Edward Adam Isho says, Boomers want McMagins and suburban sprawl, but we millennials don't. Does act support building up or out? Let me tell you something, Edward. Um, I lived my whole life in my 20s in four different cities, and in every one I lived downtown, downtown Wellington, downtown Auckland, downtown Calgary, downtown Regina, which, by the way, is the, the capital of Saskatchewan. Um, and a funny thing happens to you. You turn 30, uh, and suddenly you're not so sure about that. You actually want some space. Maybe you want to have kids. You want them to feel grass between your toes. So with respect, I, I don't know if you speak um, for all Millennials, but it doesn't matter because actually we support both. So you know we need to, to build up uh, in some areas, and we need to do that with rules that protect existing property. So there's no reason why the city's not going to get taller. What I do have an objection to is building six stories right up beside a single family home. That's when it creates friction. On the other hand, this country is completely. Um, uh, you know, devoid. It's the, I mean, I fly from Auckland to Wellington every week. There's no shortage of land out there. We're 0.8% populated. Um, we have a huge amount of land, but you're not allowed to build on it. And freeing that land up is one of the most powerful things we can do um, to allow a better world um, for the next generation who want to feel that grass between their toes. So, you know, a bit of a mixed answer for you there. I think we largely agree with you. Um, what have we got here? Would X support income splitting for married civil union and de facto couples? Jonathan, that's a really great question. The, the easy answer is to have one tax rate. Then it doesn't matter how many people in your household are earning income, they're all paying the same. Um, so long as we have progressive taxation, you're right, it's unfair because if you have one person who goes to work, they get taxed more than two people working half time. Um, and for some people, you know, it's really important that one parent can stay home. Um, what I do know is that no government has done it because it's administratively quite difficult. So I can't promise we would, but I, I can see why people like the idea. And ultimately, it's an argument for a flatter uh, tax. Um, Joss Nichols says, what's happening with the MP pay cut from Ben Smart? Hey, mate, I wish I knew. So basically, I suggested this back in mid-March. Um, I got a bill drafted. I went into Parliament. I asked for permission to have it introduced, uh, Labour Party objected. They've subsequently said that they are going to cut MPs' pay. Jacinda got lots of publicity for saying she'd do it. They still haven't actually produced a bill to do it. And the thing is, you know, we can't just cut our pay. We have to pass a law to do it. MPs' pay is protected by law, long story. Um, so at the moment, the government say they're going to do it. They haven't. And every week they don't. There's just another week that you can see that they're all about PR and less about actually taking action. Um, it's going to have to be the final uh, question because um, the House is going back at 7.30 and I've got to run in there. Uh, Joss Nichols asked about immigration policy. Do you support mass immigration to New Zealand? Uh, no, of course not. And I think it's really important to, to note 
how strict um, our, uh, our immigration policy actually are. You've got to get 160 points. And I just say to people, go on the Immigration New website, New Zealand website and see how hard it is to do. So we've got a whole lot of people uh, who are coming to New Zealand because they are skilled, uh, because they fill job op uh, they, put, they fill job gaps in the job market, uh, and they actually make sure that there are more jobs because companies can grow and employ more people. So I don't support what the UK had. I understand why they did Brexit because basically 500 million people could just freely go there and they couldn't set their own conditions. Um, the British are now introducing what they call a, an Australian style immigration scheme. It's really a New Zealand scheme that they're introducing. Uh, and that's what we should support. We should support immigration policy where people come here if they have the right skills and have a rigorous way of assessing that, which is what we do. Um, look, I got to go. So thanks. We've had such a great crowd and good numbers watching this. Uh, this video will stay there so you can still watch it later. But I hope I've given you some idea of what we're proposing for an alternative budget, what you're voting for uh, if you vote for ACT, what sort of voice we'll be taking to the table uh, if we're in a position to negotiate with the Nats to form a government after this. So thank you very much. Have a great night.